I would like to uh, welcome uh, uh, our keynote speaker, Kenneth Kukier, who is going to um, who is going to talk to us about uh, who is going to challenge us uh, um, uh, uh, and and our, our conceived notions about you know uh, about about what it is to uh, to innovate. And um, uh, Kenneth is from The Economist. It's my favorite um, uh, magazine. Um, he has got a, a massively impressive sort of bio that I won't uh, uh, speak to you about because you can find it out uh, uh, um, uh, from the leaflet and online. Um, uh, and um, I would like to welcome you to the stage, Kenneth. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Aaron. Uh, it is such a delight to speak to all of you uh, today, uh, in part because I, like so many people, have such incredible respect for what you're doing. So for me, it's a, it's a great personal honor, in particular, in addition to talking to an organization that I respect, to tell an organization about some of the things that I've been thinking about for the last few years about data to see how it might apply to the work that you do. Big data is a very big topic. My topic today is not just big data, it's about big data big and small. But the place to start, of course, is with the idea of bigness. And that's the idea of more. More. It's more. More. So what's more? Well, I want you to know that more sometimes isn't just more. Sometimes more is new. Sometimes more is better. Sometimes more is different. We can think about that if we think about, for example, writing. Right? Writing was invented around 8,000 BC. We had you know, pressed in uh, characters into clay tablets. And so we had words. And words were fixed in a media. And you could say that at the advent of the printing press that it wasn't really that important. Right? I mean, after all, we had words and we had books prior to printing, and now we had books and we had words and fixed there. So you know, scribes, there was an improvement there in efficiency. You had scribes before hand writing the books, and now you could print the books. It really wasn't all that impressive. All it was, after all, was more. But of course, if you made that claim, you'd be incredibly wrong, because by dint of having so much more works at such an increasing level of scale in terms of volume and a decreasing cost, it led to huge changes that you couldn't really expect, you couldn't anticipate. It eroded the authority of the church. It undermined the power of the monarchy. It gave birth to the scientific method and to the enlightenment and to the flourishing of the culture and the renaissance. More wasn't just more. Today, we've got a similar shift as we take the book and the instantiation of words and we put it onto a digital platform. <laughs> That's really not the, it's really not a big change because after all, we had books before. These are just books. All it is is more. Well, I'd argue that that's not true. Suddenly when we can actually see what people are reading and they can see it and we can find out when they read, how they read. I know as a book author, if I find out that Two-thirds of my readers give up after chapter seven of a 10-chapter book. That tells me something. If I find out that many of them are reading it in small 15-minute you know, chunks versus reading it in big two-hour chunks, I learn something else in that. Generally, also, from the consumer side, you get niche products that are no longer defined by geography, and so it breaks the model of mass publishing, and you can see a new flourishing of literature that is going to emerge from this. The point here, of course, is that more is not just more. More is new, is better, and it's different. So with this as a context, with this as a backdrop, let me tell a story. And it's the story of the flu. Now, you're all in the business of treating patients who are ill, and so you know something about the flu. The audience today is coughing while I'm talking. So some, I think we all have these uh, lingering symptoms of the winter. Thank you very much, sir, for validating my point. And so how do we know who has the flu? Well, we could listen to people in the audience. We could count them. And so for many, many years, that's exactly what we did. We would like to count people who had the flu. And so this is a picture from maybe the, uh, the 1910s, I think, of the US Navy. 
Uh, but we still do that today. The Centers of Disease Control counts how many people have the flu who come into the registered clinics that report to the CDC. And that's how we know, generally, what's happening in terms of flu. And we know when they're coming in. We know, going, we know where they're coming in. We can have models, and we've got fairly elaborate and good models to identify outbreaks of the flu. And that's pretty good. But what would it look like in a world of more? Right? How could we do that differently? Well, a company has tried, and they were maybe successful. Let's think about this. Were they or not? The company was Google. They received millions and billions of searches each day from around the world. And they had the idea that they were going to uh, see if there was a correlation between searches, just searches, and flu outbreaks based on the CDC data. And so they ran through some algorithmic models. Specifically, they took the 200 million most common searched terms, because some terms are you know, so unique there's only one of a kind. And then they crunched it through a machine learning algorithm, and they did this 500 million times. So half a billion mathematical models to correlate what terms best matched best fit the areas of where there was flu outbreaks in the US across nine different regions in the US that the CDC reports over. And they found it, right? By doing this enough, their algorithms were able to de define these are the 45 most common words that, that together, ensemble, create a best fit that this is where the flu outbreaks. So they could actually identify at the outset of the flu season or during it, where, how much flu was going on, where it was traveling, et cetera. Now, on the basis of this, Google flu trends became a feature of what Google was reporting, and some public health authorities were using it. Who here has heard of Google flu trends? Raise your hand if you have. OK, many of you. Very interesting. So about, about a third of you. You also may know something else. Lo and behold, you know, as time went on, stopped working so well. It seemed like things were going out of whack. In fact, some Harvard professors uh, wrote a paper in which they joked that Google flu trends was actually predicting winter rather than predicting <laughs> where the flu was. Right? It's, unfa it's an unfair criticism, but, it's a, it's, but, it's a, but it was cute because it was published in the journal Science. So it, it turns out, yeah, it's true, that over time, the correlation wasn't matching quite as well. And that seemed to be a bit of a problem. And they wrote their paper about the, the traps in big data analysis. Okay? But there's a small problem with their, with their analysis indeed. And the first one is ground truth. Some people go into a clinic and they don't have the flu. The doctors know that. But still more people probably don't ever show up into a clinic but do have the flu. So in fact, CDC is only a simulacrum of what's happening in terms of the reality of where there's a flu. It's not actually the flu. So who is to say, indeed, whether the Google flu trends analysis of search queries was perhaps more accurate than the CDC reporting? Consider that the time when, this, when, the, when the data was going haywire was a period during the financial crisis. A lot of people might have felt, I can't afford to take a day off of work to go to a clinic. I'm just going to suffer through. So people who otherwise might have actually gone to a clinic didn't. We don't know. Turns out I don't think that's the, the real example. I think there's a lot of others, and they're changing the model. But that's one thing to consider. The second thing, but more important still, is that buried in that same paper that criticized Google flu trends was this sentence. Does this mean, I'm a Harvard professor, does this mean that the current version of Google Flu Trends is not useful? No. Greater value can be obtained by combining Google Flu Trends with other near real-time health data. The other near real-time health data is CDC data. The point here is that it, when a blended model of big data and small data were put together, that worked best. It worked better than Google Flu Trends on its own, but it definitely also worked better than the CDC data on its own. So in fact, this was a great win for big data and also a great reminder that we also need small data. Okay. So what is big data? 
you've read about it in the press. You're probably sick of reading about it in the press. It's true, it's very, very hyped. At its core, though, it's this. There are things we can do with a large body of data that we fundamentally cannot do when we're only working with smaller amounts. That the change in scale leads to a change in state. That a quantitative shift leads to a qualitative shift. Or that more isn't just more. More is new, better, and different. So what does more look like? More looks like this. You can see that by the year 2000, we like to think we are participating in the information society. We were doing so in name only. Even back then, the amount of analog information was vastly larger than the amount of digital information. Analog information <laughs> are things like paper books, post-it notes, vinyl LP records. But because analog information grows at a linear pace and digital information grows at an exponential pace, over time, that would, you know, by 2002, 2003, that would totally be on parity. And then, whoosh, and because digital information seems to double every, uh, every two years, and this data is from 2007, if you were to extrapolate to 2010, the purple part would be twice as big, the, the pink on top would be half as large, and then by 2013, we'd be through the floor and through the ceiling, you know, onto the second story, maybe the third story of the building. And these trends don't look like they're going to stop anytime soon. There's many facets of big data, <clears throat> many technologies that are related to it, and there's just one I want to talk to you about today, and it's the area of machine learning. Machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence, which itself is a branch of computer science, but the real interesting shift that's taken place recently is that machine learning is, owes more probably to mathematics and statistics than to computer science. To understand what machine learning is, it's the idea that we can have computers do things without the explicit instruction of human beings to tell them what to do, because we've programmed them to think in this way, to, to work in this way. It's useful to think about, or useful to know, the origin of machine learning. How did we get there? And it dates back to the 1950s in the United States with a computer scientist who worked for IBM named Arthur Samuel. And Arthur Samuel liked to play checkers, known as drafts in Britain. And so he did what anyone in the 1950s who's a computer scientist would do. He programmed a computer to play checkers. And so he played the, the machine, and he won. And he played the machine again, and he won. He played the machine again, and he won. Because the machine only knew what a legal move was. Arthur Samuel knew something else. Arthur Samuel knew strategy. So he wrote a small subprogram to operate in the background. It did something really simple. All it did was it calculated the likelihood that a given board configuration would lead to a winning board or a losing board. Okay? So a person would make a move, redo the calculations, make a move, redo the calculations, particularly at the end of the game, redo the probability table. He played the machine. He won. He played the machine. He won. And then he left the machine to play itself. It played itself. It collected more data. It collected more data. It improved the accuracy of its predictions. And then he came back to play the machine, and he lost. And he played the machine, and he lost. And Arthur Samuel had created a machine that surpassed his own abilities in a task that he taught it. And this idea of machine learning is going everywhere. So if you were to type into Google the name of the founder of Médecins Sans Frontières, and you were to misspell it, how did Google know? You know who at Google you know, typed in the correct answer and then returned it to you, say, hey, maybe you're thinking about this guy, not that guy. Right? Well, of course, nobody at Google knew this. It was a machine learning algorithm that did it. Basically, it just simply scoured the internet, saw that instantiations for Bernard Kushner with a K were vastly more common than with a C. And so it said, hey, are you sure you're really looking for this person with a C? I think you're looking for the person with the K. Right? Research recently by, in Stanford had a machine learning algorithm look at biopsies of cancer cells to identify which were, if you see if the machine could actually identify which were highly cancerous. And sure enough, by running it through a computer vision algorithm and a machine learning algorithm, the computer, the algorithm was able to identify 
the 12 telltale signs that best predict that a given cell biopsy is cancerous, highly cancerous. The problem, the medical literature only knew nine of them. Three of the traits were things that the human beings didn't know to look for, but were spotted in the algorithm. Now, one reason why we have so much data around the world today is we're collecting more things on things that we always collected data on. But another reason why is that we're taking things that have always been informational and we're rendering it into a data format. We're datifying it, for so to speak. Okay, so let's think about it, what this means, for example, location, okay? Where location is has always been a matter of information but it's never been a matter of data. So if I were to ask, where is Hippocrates, the you know, father of Western medicine, is he in the operating theater or is he in the agora, right? Where Hippocrates is, is a matter of information. It's informational, but it's not data. We do know that today our location is datafied. Wherever we are in the world, there is a spreadsheet somewhere, a database, that knows exactly where we have been every second of our lives and our location, right? Every second of our lives going back for at least a decade. The database is in Langley, Virginia, but nevertheless, or it's in our cell phone, uh, <laughs> cell phone carriers, but nevertheless, it exists. Data, your know, location is a matter of data. We can take a look at posture, the way you're all sitting right now, the way that Ivan sits, the way that Pete sits, the way that others sit. It's all different, and it's a function of your leg length and your back and the distribution of your weight. And if I was to put 100 sensors into your chair right now, I could create an index that's fairly unique to you. Okay, it's sort of like a fingerprint, but it's not your finger. So what could I do with this? What could I do with this if I had to create an index of the data? Well, researchers in Tokyo are using this as a potential anti-theft device in cars. The idea is that Car driver, car jacker sits, jumps behind the wheel of the car, tries to speed off, and the car recognizes that a non-approved driver is behind the wheel. Okay? If you're the parent of a teenager, perhaps you can think of useful benefits of this technology as well. Okay. The idea is that when we datafy more aspects of our lives, we can store it, we can share it, we can process it, and we can extract new value from this information. So, so far I've been talking about web searches and I've been talking about car seats, but I want to suggest to you that I'm not really talking about web searches and I'm not really talking about car seats. I'm talking about a new way to think about the world, to look at everything as a platform for the collection and the analysis of data. So let's think about what more means when there's more to more than just more. So more is useful, but small is also beautiful. The details are divine, and we've seen that as well in the project that you all have been working on, the missing maps, and Pete Masters is going to talk about this uh, on a panel after I speak. The benefit of being able to take small data and is that we can also drill down into it, and we can look at it at a very human scale. This is an article that The Economist wrote about the, the missing maps initiative. Right? It gives us a new form of visibility, and we can imagine that we've done this sort of thing before. If I try to understand how aid donors give aid around the world into, into developing countries, that's one thing. But if I was to geotag exactly where that aid goes, suddenly we get a different perspective. We see things that we couldn't see before. In this case, when aid data was able to take you know, the hundreds of aid programs in Kenya and were to geotag exactly where the aid was spent to the very municipality, Right, to, the, to the GPS coordinates of where the money went, suddenly Ken, projects in Kenya look quite different. Right? The areas that are darkest that show where the largest poverty is don't get that much aid. And strangely enough, those places that are a day trip from the Nairobi airport do. Hmm, so you wonder, is it for the convenience, is it for the benefit of the, for the, for the people who are the recipients or for the convenience of the, those who are giving the money? Okay. And if you map on uh, the tribal areas as well, you see a very different look as well. Big data allows us to have a different form of visibility than we had before. And all of this culminates in the question of Ebola. Now, the world owes a debt to MSF 
for your incredible work with Ebola. It, it, I think it's, it's a story that most people who are aware of the issue know, but not enough people in the world know. And I think that as you wake up in the morning and look in the mirrors, among the, the reasons that you can be inspired for what you do, this really stands tall. I mean, it, ma it makes you, it fulfills you as a mission, and it realizes your values. And, I, and as a message for those of us who are aware of what you've done, we are the great champions and ambassadors to get that message out. The problem, if you remember, at the height of the crisis was actually knowing what was going on and where, and most importantly still, how it was spreading, where it was going. Right? Now, there is a way to identify where it's going because it's a really hard data problem, and that is through the humble mobile phone. Because lots of people, not everyone, the mobile phone's a shared device in Africa as it is in other developing regions, but the whole point is that with the mobile phone, you can still get a good proxy of where people are going, how long they're staying, what they're doing. If people are fleeing one area and going somewhere else to another major city, you don't want to put your intervention where that other major city is. That's lunacy, right? Because by the time they get there, they're infecting the people there. You want to find out what transport hubs they're going through, where they sort of congregate, how long they congregate, how long it takes them, right? Are they traveling by rail? Are they traveling by, by path? Are they on foot or are they on car? All of these things are really essential to know how to target your intervention. And lo and behold, the call data records of mobile phones will answer that for you. It's not perfect, but it's, it's a, a step change of improvement. It's orders of magnitude better than the models that we've had in the past. Right? This, was, this is sort of one of the most effective ways that we could have staunched Ebola if it was going to spiral out of control, as it seemed at the height of the crisis that it was going to spiral out of control. The problem, those records were not released. It existed, sort of the gold dust that could have saved humanity if there was going to be a huge crisis, not just a, not just a manageable crisis, but a crisis that was spiraling out of control and was going to go everywhere. That prized information that could have been so beneficial was simply not put into play. For the operators, you know, there's a cost to it. They don't want to potentially lose their license because of privacy issues. For regulators, they just don't understand this. They don't have the competence to sort of figure these things out. And if you knock on their door, they're still not going to get it. And they're, they're just not, they don't have the institutional capacity to sort of, to, to, to respond in these sorts of, in sorts of ways. And we know that because it's, particularly the telecom regulator in, in a lot of developing countries is basically an area of patronage, right? Uh, like the postmasters were in, 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 in the United States during the colonial period and, and the beginning of the republic. And for the politicians, well, they just don't know. And it's not even the responsibility to know, but it's the responsibility to act. So they, they've got to get better advice. We are lucky. The world dodged a bullet during that period. And it would have been such a sad, um, just a really sad indictment of uh, the human capacity to respond to crises if it did become a calamity and this very valuable data was not put into play to, to help staunch it. But we can't afford anymore to sort of to be complacent. So I think now that it seems like we can all catch our breath is the time that we need to push forward and make the case for using data to solve some of our global problems, and in particular, Ebola, and in particular, or other communicable diseases, and in particular, using call data records. It requires leadership, <laughs> not just any leadership, leadership that appreciates the value of data. Okay? Now, there are risks to the big data universe as well. Right? Understanding where people are going in an anonymous and aggregated way, which is what the CDRs would have given us if we engineered it that way, uh, would have been important. Right? Because there's serious you know, privacy implications. On the other hand, keep in mind, it would be very trivial, very trivial for, for telecom operators to install an algorithm that listen to coughs. And so if the phone is on and someone's talking and they hear maybe three coughs within, the, within 60 seconds, it identifies who that person is and that that person probably has a, a communicable disease and identifies and says, go after that guy, that woman. right? That seems to me like a very dangerous area, terrain to get into. So we want to think about how we want to use this technology. These risks are real. So the risk of privacy, 
is paramount. We've got to think about it in times without the crisis so that we know how to respond when there is the crisis, so we can preserve our values when we implement this new technology. There is the idea of propensity, right? If we see some, someone's coughing, it doesn't mean that they have the communicable disease. There could be lots of reasons. It could be dusty. We all know Africa is pretty dusty, right? So are we going to penalize someone on the basis of a prediction? Or are we going to actually you know, give a mouth swab to find out if they actually have it? It's about ground truth again, right? Not simply about the likelihoods, not about probabilities. We have to remember, ultimately, that the data is only a simulacrum of reality. It's not the real thing, in the same way that a map is not territory. And while we need to embrace the big data era, we need to do so in a way that follows our values and our sense of judgment, taste, and, and decency. I think the benefits outweigh the drawbacks, and I look forward to seeing what happens. Thanks a lot. We have a few minutes left, so I will take a few questions. Um, anyone from the floor or from uh, the internet, uh, you're very welcome to ask Kenneth uh, a few questions. There's a kind of interesting step you make, one of which is, as it were, a description, uh, an absolutely fascinating description of fact, which is the nature of the changes that you're describing. And alongside it, there's an evaluative aspect as well, which this is a good thing that is happening. But there's also a great deal of fear around big data. And I understand as a, as a, as a data expert, you're very excited, but my sense amount of public fear around these uses of data because also there's an awful lot, there's a, lot, a great lack of knowledge about the potential for data to be gathered. So I wondered if you could talk just a little bit ab ab about some of that evaluative stuff. I mean, how can we ensure that this data isn't used to release enormous amounts of information for all kinds of malevolent ends? I mean, I think there is a great risk associated with this. Yeah, you, you raise a really, really good question. And I don't have a very, very good answer. So let me go through uh, a practical answer and then a principled answer. And the practical answer is the one that you don't want to hear, but you might as well hear it now from me, which is, it's a steamroller. You can either get out of the way and let it pass and, and join the caravan, or you can get quashed by it. Because it's going to look a lot like, uh, you know, in terms of the sciences at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, uh, nuclear energy and nuclear power, right? It's just. Um, there's, going to be, there's so much interest in putting into play man's knowledge in this domain and the great potential that this can afford that we better start thinking really seriously about how we put in the, the, the shock absorbers and the trip wires and the safeguards to protect us from all the possible malevolent uh, uses of this. But the fact that, but there's, there's going to be no turning back the clock. Like once Galileo comes up with a theory, like we have to respond. Once you know, we have the you know, you know, gen genetic engineering, we're going to have to put in place the, the systems and the safeguards. We've created an entire, entire international area of international law and order around uh, nuclear nonproliferation, as well as nuclear energy. And we saw that with Fukushima. I was a Tokyo correspondent at the time, so I saw it firsthand. But still, we have uh, nuclear power. Uh, and, and nuclear medicine. We've gotten the value of the atom, even though it could poison us and destroy the planet in a second. Data is, is, is a very similar uh, dimension to um, how man grapples with his, uh, pardon the, how human, human, humanity grapples with its problems. And, uh, and we're, gonna, we're gonna certainly go for the benefits of that, but, and we're gonna have to work do the hard work of trying to find ways to solve those problems. But from a practical level, if someone tries to hold back the sands of time, they're going to get swept over by the tidal wave of it. Um, the, but, the, but the principle that you identify, if that's the practical answer, the principle you identify is exactly right. And I think we're going to have to find a way to preserve our human values in that, knowing that we're not going to do it perfectly. And there's going to be a lot of tragedies around it. There's going to be a lot of problems that we're going to, we're going to regret in the same way that we've had Three Mile Islands and Fukushima's. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kenneth. Um, I really want to thank you for coming over here and to uh, present to us, uh, you know, uh, big ideas and how that can be applied in a small manner for the benefit of our patients eventually and grapple with the risks that those present and some of the questions 
that we will for sure also encounter uh, in MSF. So thank you very much for thank your time you. and presentation.